small bowel obstruction and uh, any student okay any surgical student i like to say or any surgical intern they should be able to diagnose small bowel obstruction by taking good history and by doing good physical examination so please uh, listen to this class properly and after this class i'm sure you'll definitely know how to diagnose this now small bowel obstruction is primarily characterized by the early onset of vomiting followed by constipation so vomiting is a very early feature here early onset of vomiting followed by constipation abdominal pain may be there along with them and abdominal distension comes a little bit later so those are four cardinal features of small bowel or small intestinal obstruction vomiting constipation abdominal pain and abdominal distension that abdominal pain is a colicky in nature it is commonly due to mechanical obstruction okay mechanical obstruction see here which may be intrinsic or extrinsic as well as it may be because of partial or complete type of obstruction now this intrinsic or extrinsic obstruction may be partial or complete uh, i have uh, you know uh, compiled different causes okay in the next slide the next few slide will talk about it but the concept is important here i see this intrinsic means the growth is present probably inside the lumen of the intestine or the causes lie inside the lumen of the intestine extrinsic means outside something is causing problem from the outside pressure from the outside okay this is the meaning and it may lead to partial intestinal obstruction or complete intestinal obstruction partial still there is no uh, uh, you know complete type of constipation okay no constipation so if the person is still passing a bit of uh, you know stool there and abdominal distension is also not that massive so these are the important point small bowel obstruction can also result from paralysis of the intestinal musculature which is known as paralytic ileus in some of the textbook it is also mentioned as dynamic obstruction and adynamic obstruction dynamic means peristaltic movement is still good it is still happening and adynamic means there is no peristaltic movement there is already paralysis of the intestine occur and it is also known as paralytic ileus okay so let's elaborate on this now so what are the causes of this dynamic obstruction dynamic once again means there is active peristalsis going on see this active peristalsis peristalsis means contraction of the smooth muscles of the intestine okay peristaltic movement can occur in other areas also where there is a lumen okay on the wall the smooth muscle so there will be peristalsis now let me clarify this concept right here peristalsis is quite vigorous in case of intestinal obstruction if there is dynamic one now what happens there is a there is an area where obstruction occurs proximal to that obstruction you know the intestine will develop you know strong type of peristaltic movement because this is a natural tendency they try to push the content distally and how the contents move into the intestine because of peristalsis so peristalsis will be naturally more but how long is the question okay how long it cannot occur all the time it cannot occur every time you know after few days then intestine will be tired now there will be no more peristaltic movement and probably by that time you know they are usually distended already and there is a risk of perforation as well so this is a bit late but what the concept you need to take here is in dynamic type of intestinal obstruction there is good amount of peristaltic movement present because of that peristaltic movement there is pain okay pain this pain in the intestinal obstruction is because of this peristaltic movement that's why it is colicky in nature because peristaltic is on and off type of contraction 
Now let's go and talk about those, those causes which obstruct the lumen. There may be tumor, it may be intersusception because the proximal loop of the bowel is present inside the distal one, so it is causing obstruction. It may be because of gallstone ileus. We already talked about that before. It may be because of the impacted feces, okay? impacted feces, hard fecal matter. This is constipation. It may be because of meconium in case of a small baby, hard meconium. And it may be because of bezoars. Now, bezoars means if somebody is eating uh, inedible substances like hair, okay, uh, some, some other substances which they cannot digest, especially done by psychiatric people, then that mass you know, may lie or collect in the stomach or even a distal part. It may itself lead to obstruction. These are called bezoars. Now, what are the intrinsic lesions of the bowel wall? Yes? Uh, sir, about the, uh, uh, sir, about the bezoar. So, sir, we can say, sir, the, uh, like, sir, as you say, like, for example, in eating disorder, sir, like, for example, pika, so pika can be a uh, sort of a disorder which can cause this. Yes, yes, of course. Of course. Like, see there, not eating disorder. Eating disorder sometimes means, you know, you are eating uh, normal food in an excessive amount. That is also known as eating disorder. Or sometimes you are, you know, you don't have uh, any problem inside your body, no organic disease, but a psychological problem. Uh, and you don't eat anything like anorexia nervosa. They're also eating disorder, okay? So, yes. bezoar actually means there are different types of bezoar, like phytobezoar, trichobezoar, different, you know, terms are there. Trichobezoar means hair. Sometimes people eat hair only. They pluck the hair. Yes. Or they eat hair, you know, which is available, and then that hair cannot be digested by our GI tract. So it, it just, you know, gets trapped there, you know, and it forms a mass, and that mass yeah. makes obstruction now. So this type of uh, things are called bezoar. They are mainly uh, caused by inedible substances. Now, another cause is stricture. Stricture occurs, of course, in the lumen of the bowel. Okay, stricture on the wall and lumen. Stricture means acute narrowing of the bowel because of fibrosis. For example, there is ulceration on the bowel mucosa. That ulceration has become deeper. There is a healing going on, and that can result in stricture formation. Now, some of the extrinsic lesions which can lead to intestinal obstruction are post-operative adhesion, hernia, neoplastic masses, abscesses, and even volvulus. Now, these additions are probably the commonest cause of intestinal obstruction these days because so many people, they go for abdominal surgery because of some problem inside the abdomen. And once we open the abdomen or peritoneal cavity, there will be addition. We cannot stop it. Addition will be there. And that addition may cause two loops of the bowel fuse with each other. And that can result in obstruction. This is known as post-operative addition. Hernia, another common cause of intestinal obstruction because the content of the hernia is usually a bowel loop. Perfect example is, you know, inguinal hernia, which we have studied already. Okay, the most common content of that hernia is intestinal loop. Now, that intestinal loop may be reducible in the early phase. It doesn't cause any obstruction. But later on, if it becomes irreducible, or if uh, you know it is incarcerated there, then we call it uh, you know, obstructive type of hernia. Means the content uh, cannot flow distally now. So it, it leads to intestinal obstruction. Even strangulated hernia can result in intestinal obstruction. Usually obstructed hernia, will lead to strangulation. Now, neoplastic mass, any neoplasm which, which are developed in the abdominal cavity, like lymphoma, okay, they are quite uh, common, lymphoma. They may give pressure to the intestine from outside, can result in obstruction. Abscesses can result in obstruction in the same way. And volvulus, this is a twisting of the bowel. Okay, So that twisting nature will result in 
narrowing of the lumen and result in obstruction. Now, apart from them, the second type of intestinal obstruction are a dynamic type. A dynamic means lack of peristalsis. So this is also known as paralytic ileus. What are the causes? See here, hypokalemia. So we have studied that before. Hypokalemia is an important cause of paralytic ileus. If there is decreased potassium in the blood, then bowel can be paralyzed. Abdominal surgery, another important cause. And this is a very important practical point. Whenever the abdomen is opened, okay, after the surgeon closes the abdomen, you know, for a few days, the intestine will not work. They will develop paralysis. That's why we don't allow the patient to eat after the surgery, especially GI surgery I'm talking about here because the surgeon has handled the bowel. For example, the surgeon has done appendectomy, but they will check whether there is a, a you know, a mucus diverticulum present in the patient or not, okay? So they will pull some loops of the bowel outside. Whenever we touch the intestine, they will undergo paralysis for a few days. And during this time, don't allow the patient to eat anything because all of that will be accumulated in the GI tract because there's no peristaltic movement, okay? So when the peristaltic movement, come, movement comes back, then only allow the patient to eat. Now, how do you know when the peristaltic movements come back? How do you know clinically? Yes? Sir, we can hear. Exactly, exactly. You're absolutely right with your stethoscope. We just auscultate for bowel sound, whether you hear bowel sound or not. If bowel sounds are there, that means they again start to work. That is one thing. Another one, ask the patient whether they have passed flatus or not. Flatus means gas. Gas can be only passed when there is peristaltic movement. Okay, so these are two important points by which we know whether uh, the bowel sounds are there or not, or peristaltic movement there or not. Then we allow patient to start from a liquid diet probably sip of the water, okay? A little bit of black tea or something like that, then slowly semi-solid food and then solid food are allowed. Another cause of paralytic ileus would be infection, either inside the abdomen or sometimes, okay, nearby area also, nearby area. Now, inside the abdomen is common. What I mean is, is some uh, inter inner abdominal organ like appendicitis, Okay, cholecystitis, pancreatitis, these are the ones. So the loop of the bowel, which is very near to them, will develop paralytic ileus. Remember the term sentinel loop or sentinel bowel. We talked about that earlier. That sentinel loop or sentinel bowel is a feature of paralytic ileus as a result of nearby inflammation. And sometimes, in case of small children, even acute gastroenteritis okay, can result in a, a paralytic ileus of a particular segment of the bowel. Now, use of certain medicine, the important examples are narcotics here. Okay. Narcotics, what is another term for narcotic? Yes. Which type of drugs are narcotics? Just give me an example, which are narcotic drugs? Morphine, morphine, morphine and codeine. Exactly. Pain I'm sure every student know this. These are also known as opioid analgesics, morphine, okay, pethidine, codeine, methadone, heroin. These are the drugs. So these uh, drugs, they cause, you know, lack of peristalsis as a, as a result of that constipation. And another important cause is mesenteric vascular occlusion. This is ischemia of the bowel. When there is no blood flow to the bowel wall, it cannot develop peristaltic movement. So all of these are a dynamic type of intestinal obstruction. Now, after knowing these causes, let's talk about the clinical feature. So look at these cardinal clinical features of intestinal obstruction here. There are abdominal pain, constipation, abdominal distension, and vomiting. Okay, in whichever way you can answer, these four points should be there. 
This abdominal pain is a colicky in nature. Colicky is periodic type of pain, on and off type of pain. The pain comes and goes, comes and goes within few minutes. It is felt in the mid abdomen because intestinal loops are mainly present there, especially small intestine. We are talking now. We need to know the site, the radiation, the duration. An aggravating and relieving factor. Whenever we talk about any pain, always remember that. So, pain history should include all these points together. Ask the patient from where, okay, you experience the pain first. What is the site? And this is the history. You don't allow the patient to point in the abdomen right now. Okay, this is the history. A patient should uh, answer that in their own word. You should help them probably. Is it from the right upper part of the abdomen, left upper part, central part, left lower part, okay, a right lower part? These are the absolutely you know uh, desirable terms in history taking. And during physical examination, you know, you can ask uh, all those things during inspection and things like that. You can exactly ask the patient, can you show me where is the pain like that? Now, radiation is important. Duration, how long is important, and what are the aggravating and relieving factors? All these are important points in any type of, uh, you know, history taking during the pain. Now there is constipation. This constipation, you know, can be uh, absolute constipation or relative one. Absolute means no gas, nothing is passed. Even even the gas is not passed. Okay. Uh, sometimes it is also known as obstipation, if, if it is an absolute one. Distension occurs early in the course of the uh, illness if the obstruction is high. Otherwise, it occurs a little bit late. For example, duodenal obstruction or uh, you know, proximal segment of the jejunal obstruction, the, uh, uh, the abdominal distension will be much earlier rather than you know, terminal part of the ileal obstruction, for example, it takes time. Or colon obstruction, it of course takes time. And vomiting, again, occurs earlier in the course of the obstruction. It, it occurs much earlier if the proximal segment of the bowel is obstructed. Like duodenal obstruction, vomiting is much earlier than jejunum. And jejunal obstruction, the vomiting is earlier than ileal obstruction. And what is the content of the vomiting? We should ask this question. Is it green in color or not? And if it is green in color, you know that, okay, the obstruction is distal to the opening of common bile duct, then only the vomiting can be green. If it is occurring proximal to that, the vomiting is never green. So these are very, very important point. Okay, so let's move on. Now, what are the signs of obstruction? These are the symptoms you, you have seen. Now, what are the signs? Signs means during physical examination, what you get there. Now, patient is dehydrated in case of small bowel obstruction. Now, in the examination, this is a common question we love to ask. What are the mechanism or the causes of dehydration in this type of case? Now, see here, it occurs due to loss of fluid from the extracellular fluid compartment when vomiting, okay? So it is usually the extracellular fluid loss when the patient vomit. So vomiting is one of the main cause of dehydration here. At the same time, the GI tract secretes six liters of fluid per day. And during obstruction, this tends to be sequestered, okay? So this is what the GI tract is doing, you know, every day. And at the same time, patient is drinking fluid. All this fluid is getting absorbed from the GI tract. Now, what is happening? When there is constipation, when there is, you know, nothing is moving distally, now whatever is secre secretion occurring there, it, 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 is, it is lying there, you know, it is accumulating there. And this is known as third space loss. Third space loss. 
this is not useful for our body though it it looks or it seems like it is still inside the body it is not lost outside then why why our body is still getting dehydrated because it has already come out of our circulatory system it is not present inside the arterial system it is in the lumen of the bowel so this is known as third space loss okay so this is one of the very very important cause of dehydration hypovolemia may result in hypotension and tachycardia every one of you know that tachycardia is the earlier feature and hypotension comes very late when there is you know a uh, decompensated type of dehydration that is the very correct description for hypotension fall in blood pressure is never early our body can you know compensate for decrease in blood pressure but when all those mechanism fail okay then only hypotension occur now what is the definition of hypotension according to the blood pressure measurement anybody yes what is what is the definition of hypotension systolic blood pressure below 90 and diastolic blood pressure below 60 90 okay. by 60 okay now okay good so that is a good answer but remember one thing diastolic blood pressure is not considered for the definition of hypotension only systolic is considered and you are right it is less than 90 less than 90 systolic blood pressure okay less than 90 mm mercury systolic blood pressure with sign and symptoms are called hypotension so that is important one because sometimes what happens you know patient uh, blood pressure is 90 but they are not symptomatic they are fine there is no dizziness no headache nothing no palpitation no tachycardia nothing it's normal for them but along with uh, uh, drop in blood pressure if other clinical features are there then we call it hypotension now this is pathological now we have to examine the abdomen okay this is known as per abdominal examination for the confirmation of intestinal obstruction and uh, we start with inspection then we go to the palpation okay then percussion and auscultation percussion is not that very important here but it is important for other medical causes so let's include all of that abdominal examination has four component inspection palpation percussion auscultation now what are the findings inspection and palpation of the abdomen may reveal scar distension peristalsis hernias but no tenderness if the blood supply is cut off then tenderness may develop now see there it may reveal scar there may be prior scar on the surface of the anterior abdominal wall and you got the diagnosis there now how how you got the diagnosis if scars are there then what is the cause of intestinal obstruction usually abdominal surgery sir yes. abdominal uh, sir adhesion 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 very good adhesions are the cause because of prior abdominal surgery yes adhesion occur because of prior abdominal surgery and they they are most probably the cause of intestinal obstruction but not always in medicine is never 100% who knows there is a addition occurring but that may not be the cause of intestinal obstruction it may happen okay but those those are the most probable causes distension we can easily see by inspection peristaltic movement we can see by inspection hernias are you know easily seen and if you suspect hernia but they are not easily seen what you do ask the patient to cough ask the patient to stand okay and cough and look very carefully at that site especially the inguinal region now that is called cough impulse test so hernia may be visible now or you put your finger there and ask the patient to cough you may feel something is descending down so this is also hernia but usually let's come to the practical point now if herniation has already occurred the intestinal obstruction now hernia is visible very easily and that hernia is usually non reducible or irreducible it is present there all the time it is not going inside so you don't need to do all those tests okay it is already there 
acute intestinal obstruction doesn't have any tenderness in the abdomen because it is not uh, you know caused by uh, you know those uh, inflame inflammation or infective pathology usually one exception is there if there is ischemia development because of acute mesenteric occlusion then tenderness may develop slowly now during auscultation we can hear for bowel sound okay hear for bowel sound now the bowel sound may be hyperactive this is known as borborygmy okay hyperactive bowel sound are called borborygmy and these are seen in dynamic type of intestinal obstruction whereas in a dynamic intestinal obstruction or paralytic ileus bowel sounds are absent so remember this okay it is the same diagnosis intestinal obstruction but in one type there is increase or hyperactive bowel sound in other type bowel sounds are absent now for rectal examination what we get this is also important part of the abdominal exam and if we do that okay this is also known as a digital rectal examination or dre digital rectal examination we put our, our finger into the anal canal and examine there that is called per rectal examination it may be empty after 24 to 48 hours of the symptom because nothing is passing distally there is no stool felt or palpated there and when you check your finger after you have done digital rectal examination there is nothing on the globed finger let's move on now what are the investigation we like to do here remember this is a case of small bowel obstruction first of all we do some general types of investigation like what is the level of uh, urea and creatinine isn't it we do that what is the level of electrolyte this is a case of dehydration this is a case of vomiting uh, this is a case of loss of fluid okay uh, either because of vomiting to outside or because of third space loss so we need to make sure how kidneys are functioning what is the state of hypovolemia what is the state of dehydration what is sodium level what is potassium level all those things now the most important test uh, you know apart from them are radiological test which gives us the diagnosis now this radiological test okay are the plain x ray these are the plain x ray of the abdomen we can take plain x ray of the abdomen in two okay important way one is supine another is sitting supine or sitting or standing sitting or standing anything you want to say so supine okay if we take the supine view then there would be obstructive picture of dilated small bowel would be seen they are distended with gases okay they are increase in caliber those are the important points and if we see uh, or if we take x ray in the sitting or standing position there will be multiple air fluid level seen in the obstruction multiple air fluid level okay i have i have compiled some of the x rays we will see that in the uh, subsequent slides uh, let's uh, let me finish that first to distinguish the site where is the obstruction we have got certain clinical clues there or certain radiological clues there like obstructed jejunum shows transverse marking running right across the bowel which is known as valvulae coniventus so if jejunum is obstructed then we say valvulae coniventus there okay this is because of the nature okay because of the you know anatomical pattern of the jejunum or because of the histology of the jejunum there in the ileum the markings are absent they are not seen in the ileum and if the large bowel is obstructed then we can see hostral marking these hostra are the hallmarks of large intestine but right now we are talking about the small intestinal obstruction so there is no point talking about hostra but if we talk the overall intestinal obstruction okay then hostrations are seen only 
in the large bowel obstruction. Whereas valvular equinoventus is very commonly seen in jejunal obstruction. Now, uh, let me uh, show some of the X-ray. See here. See this? All of you, please focus here. The barium, uh, you know, uh, test or barium swallow, barium meal, barium follow through are not routinely done. Okay, in a case of uh, small intestinal obstruction, because we are afraid that they may be hugely dilated, the bowel wall is very thinner, and it may lead to you know leakage of the this uh, you know type of substance which is highly irritating barium. You know, if it leaks outside, then it can lead to peritonitis. But this is one of the, uh, you know, barium meal X-ray, which is shown here. Now, can you, uh, you know, interpret what is what is seen here? Just just have a look, all of you. They're showing a clear sign of obstruction, sir. Exactly. There's a clear sign of obstruction. There, there is also, uh, you know, uh, you know, pointed or marked here. In this area, there is obstruction. Now, how I know in this area there is obstruction? because the dye has not gone distally. Where is the dye here? It is acutely you know, ended here. See this? The stomach, I can see the dye. Okay. The dye is flowing in the lumen of the stomach. See this? And this is the duodenum. Probably this is a case of duodenal atresia or duodenal obstruction. Okay, So this is a good X-ray, which is giving us the diagnosis. Let's see some more. Oh, see here. What can you see? This is a X-ray which is taken in the erect posture, upright means erect posture, and these are the different air fluid level you can see. See this air fluid levels are always seen as a horizontal line when taking the X-ray because gases moves upward and the fluid goes downwards. So there will be a clear cut line develops between the air and the fluid. So here is one air fluid level. Here is another one. Here also, here, here there are multiple, okay? And here also there is air fluid level. So this is a clear cut case of uh, small ball obstruction. Another one, see this, okay? Now you can see certain stacks of coin appearance. So also known as valvule coniventus. See this, if I see carefully, okay? These are the ones. Stack of coins appearance can be seen. Another uh, case you can see, you can still see some air fluid levels. See this? Not as uh, good as the previous one, but still we can see them. These are the distended loops of the bowel. Probably this X ray is taken in the supine view now because air fluid levels are not seen properly. But I can see some, some stacks of quine appearance, distended loop. Okay. Now these are the sum of the x-ray so let's go back now so generally barium meal follow through and enema are contraindicated in this case i just explained this because of the risk of perforation because of the risk of leaking of this contrast material outwards into the peritoneal cavity that's why uh, this barium type of x-ray are not commonly done in this type of case let's move further in today's class let's talk about uh, what are the you know principles of management of intestinal obstruction? <clears throat> now see here, the underlying management can be summarized as a drip and suck. This is the important term. Drip and suck means you give IV fluid to the patient and you keep on sucking the GI tract because it is obstructed. It has got large amount of fluid collection as well as air collection. So drip and suck. This is the principle of management. The patient is kept kneel per oral or kneel by mouth. Okay, kneel per oral. Nothing is given from the mouth. Nothing is given from the mouth. And if the patient is not taking anything from the mouth, then we have to continue to give IV fluids. Okay, we have to continue to give IV fluids. Now, what type of IV fluid? That is a good question to ask. It depends on the state of dehydration 
and electrolyte balance for usually this type of uh, you know patients are dehydrated because they lose a lot of fluid in the third space third space means inside the lumen of the intestine in this case okay so what we do now uh, we we give uh, sorry as you see there one minute okay so we give crystalloid okay so what are the example of crystalloid which crystalloid Yes, lactate ringer, normal saline. Normal saline. Lactate, so normal saline. Exactly, absolutely. All of you are correct. Lactate ringer or normal saline. That is the you know you know IV fluid we want here because the patient is usually dehydrated. There's no doubt about it. Let's move on. Now, what is the role of NG tube? So see there. What is the role of NG tube here? A NG tube is placed in small bowel obstruction if the patient is vomiting. This minimizes the risk of aspiration of gastric contents, especially during the induction of general anesthesia if surgery is required. Now, let me explain this, uh, you know, uh, in the some other way. Most of the time, you know, uh, the management of small bowel obstruction is done by surgery. It needs surgery, so. When we take the patient for surgery, the stomach should be empty. Stomach should be empty. Otherwise, when you are inducing the general anesthesia by uh, giving different type of drugs, so what happens? There is high chance of aspiration if something is there in the stomach because there is high chance of vomiting. So to avoid that, stomach should be emptied by putting NG tube. And what happens if the aspiration occurs during induction of anesthesia? Yes. What can happen to the patient? Aspiration pneumonia. Aspiration pneumonia. pneumonia. Exactly. Patient may die actually because of aspiration pneumonia. Patient may be very serious. So we have to avoid this thing all the time. This is very, very important practical knowledge. That's why we often tell our patient, you know, before doing any planned surgery, okay, this is called planned surgery we tell them do not eat anything okay for 4 to 6 hours just to make the stomach empty but during emergency surgery we cannot do that we cannot tell our patients like that that's why we have to empty the stomach uh, with these type of things now another important uh, point here is give the pain relief because this is a painful condition there is constant peristaltic movement going on so patient should get some pain relief that can be done by different analgesics. Antibiotic prophylaxis against sepsis should be considered. Okay, not in all cases, but if you think, if you think there is a chance of contamination of peritoneal cavity during the surgery, if this is a case of inflammation of the bowel, then antibiotic prophylaxis are indicated. Now, what are the indications for immediate surgery? Now, immediate surgery means emergency surgery. Okay, we, we do not wait. We do not treat uh, this patient by conservative way. And then we think, oh, let's see, later on we can think of surgery. Not like that. These are the indication for immediate surgery. They are increasing pain in the patient. Localized peritonism, implying perforation or ischemia already uh, you know one part of the peritoneal membrane is inflamed this is called localized peritonism implying perforation means you are afraid anytime perforation can happen and this can occur if there is a huge dilation of the bowel okay or ischemia ischemia are usually treated by surgery because already a particular segment of the bowel is functionless and you don't keep that type of bowel inside Another is complete colonic obstruction with competent ileocecal valve and cecum, which is dilated greater than eight centimeter. Now see this? So this is a large bowel obstruction they are talking about. And in case of large bowel obstruction, if the ileocecal valve is competent, competent means it is still functioning. It doesn't allow any fluid to go back from the cecum 
towards the ileum. A valve means it is always one way flow. It is always from proximal to the distal side, especially if it is working, okay? So in this case, it is still working. That means it doesn't allow any gas or any fluid to go up from the cecum towards the ileum. Now, what does that mean? Ili is uh, colon can be hugely dilated, already dilated greater than eight centimeter, that is cecum here. Yeah. So it can rupture any time, that is the danger. So take this patient for immediate surgery. Another one is closed loop, which is seen radiologically. Closed loop means, you know, they are obstructed on both ends. Now, there is a high chance of rupture or perforation. A perfect example we can give is volvulus. Volvulus, twisting of a loop of bowel. Both ends are, uh, you know, closed here. And another is obstruction occurring as a result of hernial incarceration. This is known as obstructed hernia. We don't wait. We take the patient for surgery, okay? So everything can be very easily understood. These are the indications for immediate surgery in a case of small bowel obstruction or even one point of large bowel obstruction is included here. Now, let's move on. Some other important you know, principles. If peritonism is absent, means if peritonitis is not at present, then treatment is conservative for two to three days. What is that conservative management means? Don't give anything from mouth and put NG tube and aspirate the stomach. Okay, once uh, stomach is uh, completely aspirated, uh, sometimes you know what happens, the contents from the bowel, the proximal bowel is going back towards the stomach. So continuous type of fluid can be aspirated from the stomach with NG tube as well. Now you are not going to do this, you know, forever. See this, if the features of obstruction do not resolve or if there is general deterioration of the patient's condition with onset of abdominal tenderness and tachycardia, you switch your treatment to surgery. Okay, you, you leave conservative management right there if these are the situation. But if patients, patient is getting better by conservative treatment itself, you don't need to take the patient for surgery. So this is the, this is the point here. Large bowel obstruction if it is caused by fecal impaction, means constipation, then it may be treated with enema or manual removal of the fishes. This type of treatment is quite easy. You don't need to do much here. Just give a bowel enema. Soap water enema is fine here. Okay, Glycerin suppository is also okay. Or sometimes even manual removal of fishes is necessary if it is very hard type of fecal matter. Non-mechanical bowel obstruction, also known as paralytic ileus, will usually resolve with conservative treatment and removal of any precipitating cause. Like if it is a, if it's caused by hypokalemia, give potassium there, that will take care of the situation. Okay. So similarly, you can give a, a bit of other reason. Like if it is caused by medicine, stop the drugs. Now, a bit of practical point, I'm not sure, okay, whether you were taught this before or not, how to put NG tube. Though we are talking a bit theoretically here, but whenever there is chance, you know, always uh, we'll, we'll show you how to put NG tube practically. But if you pay attention, you will definitely know how to put it. So please pay attention. A nasogastric tube or NG tube in the short form is a fine or narrow bore See there, fine or narrow bowl tube passed into the stomach via the nose. That's why nasogastric tube. It is used for a short or medium term nutritional support, especially in pediatric age group when the babies are very small. You know, this is mainly used for nutritional support. Even in adults, if they are not eating much, if they cannot eat anything from the mouth, this can be done. And is the most common route used in tube feeding. It is also used to decompress patients with intestinal obstruction. And that is the main function we are talking here. In this case, we are using it for the decompression purpose. 
A wide bore tube is used if drainage is needed. For example, a gauge greater than or equal to 10. Okay. Now, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, the unit. These are the different, you know, size of NG tube. We call it 8 French, 10 French, like that. Okay. Otherwise, a fine bore tube is used. It, it depends what is the age of the patient also. In adult, we, we tend to put a bit of, you know, wider one. In case of pediatric age group, a bit of a smaller one. Now, how to put? This is important one. So please pay attention. To pass an nasogastric tube, sit the patient up. Number one. Number two, you have to measure how much distance you have to put inside. And that measurement is done by from the breeze of the nose. Okay. Breeze of the nose means the upper part of the nose, you know, uh, the, the part of the nose which is right there on the forehead. That is called breeze of the nose to the air lobe and from there to the gyphoid process. Now, see there how to do it. First, from the breeze of the nose to the air lobe, okay, either on the left or the right, only one side, okay, not both sides, only one side, and to the gyphoid process. So, this is the total distance of the tube you are going to put inside. And you, there is a marking in the uh, on the GI, uh, sorry, NG tube. So, you can note there, yes, this is the distance which I should put inside, okay. Now, using the 16 to 20 gauze tube. Now, another one is lubricate the end of the tube. Lubricants are easily available there in the hospital or in the clinic. Lubricate it and give the patient some ice to suck and put the tube into the patient's nose. Okay. Now, ask the patient to, to swallow it. So see this. Gently pass it back, asking the patient to swallow. This is important one. You have to encourage the patient all the time. Push the tube to the measured distance, which you have measured right now, and aspirate it back. Now, the very, very important you know, part, rapidly inject 20 ml of air down the tube whilst listening over the stomach for a gurgling type of sound. Now, if you do not hear any gurgling sound on that area, what does that mean? Anybody? What does that mean? So there is something stuck in the uh, tube and there is no uh, pass, uh, completely clear passage from the uh, nasogastric area to the sir, uh, sir, we can hear the stomach gurgling sound. Sir, like, sir, when food liquid or anything is like traveling. Because sir, if it's not traveling, sir, then, it's, it's, then it's a direct uh, sign of uh, obstruction in there, basically. Mm -hmm. Sir, the tube, uh, maybe, sir, the tube may be in the trachea. Yeah. Very good. Now see there. Very excellent answer. Now see this. Why I am pushing this 20 ml of air through the tube and listening over the stomach just to make sure the tip of the tube is in the right place. The right place means in the lumen of the stomach in this case. Sometimes what happens? The tube may go towards the airway. Sometimes it may go into the trachea. Sometimes it is reaching the lung and you are completely unaware of the situation. So if you do not, uh, you know, confirm where is the tube and start, you know, giving some fluid from there or, you know, start aspirating it and nothing comes out, you'll be frustrated. And especially if you put something inside, you know, if it is in the lung, think about aspiration and all those things. So make sure where is the tip of the tube. And to confirm that, okay, rapidly inject 20 ml, um, 20 ml of air by attaching the syringe onto one end of the NG tube, put the stethoscope over the epigastric area of the patient. And when you hear that gurgling sound, okay, that, that air which passes the stomach, you are quite sure, yes, I am in the right area. So this is very, very important aspect of the NG tube placement. Always we do this. If the procedure fails, a smaller diameter tube can be used. And having confirmed that the tube is in the stomach, it is secured in place with the tape. This is just a theoretical you know, discussion, but I'm sure you already have, have the concept how to put it. And don't worry, 
it is one of the easiest thing to do in the clinical practice and we do it all the time with our patient now let's move on let's talk about how to do surgery for small bowel obstruction now, where the cause of the small bowel obstruction is indeterminate you don't know before opening the abdomen where is the cause usually a bigger type of incision is given that is median or paramedian incision okay so a bigger you know picture is there when we open the abdominal cavity median means right there in the in the linea alba median incision paramedian is a bit on the side now caution must be exercised when incising the peritoneum sometimes what happen a distended loop of the bowel may stuck there on the peritoneum or may lie just below it and if we do not take care of that we may incise or we may damage the loop of the bowel and this is a disaster because that loop of the bowel may have some fluid contents inside some food content also if patient has eaten you know so it may contaminate the peritoneal cavity that should not happen that should not happen as far as possible but don't worry even if it has happened you should know how to tackle it clean the peritoneal cavity thoroughly and close that damaged loop of the bowel a uh, experienced surgeon can do that uh, you know uh, without getting nervous the first step is to decide whether a small or large bowel obstruction is present isn't it now how to do that please listen properly to confirm it the surgeon will will try to find out where is cecum okay and cecum is present in the right iliac fossa so surgeon will try to find the cecum and just look at the cecum okay if the cecum is enlarged now if the cecum is enlarged or dilated or distended that means this is a case of large bowel obstruction whereas if it is flaccid okay if it is flaccid means if, if it is not distended it is collapse it usually confirms the presence of small bowel obstruction the reason is very simple in case of small bowel obstruction it is usually occur proximal to the ileocecal junction because that is a small bowel we know a small bowel ends at ileocecal junction so why should cecum be distended but nothing is passing distal to that so cecum will be collapse so this is the case of small bowel obstruction uh, uh whereas cecum is the first part of small intestine uh, sorry large intestine or large bowel or colon so if anything occurs distal to that then cecum is always distended okay. this is a very very important point now when a small bowel obstruction has been confirmed discover the site of the lesion is the next objective now how to do that so what the surgeon do they will take out the part of the small intestine as much as possible through the wound and thorough examination is undertaken so they will take out all the loops of the small bowel outside okay and look okay throughout the length of the small bowel so they they need to handle a large you know part of the small bowel during that time this is the way they need to see very carefully where is the site of obstruction now after they find it okay after they find it how to do decompress or how to do decompression of the dilated loop of the bowel this is another important point now this may be through one of several routes one is manual manipulation of gas and fluid back to the stomach where it is removed by via the ng tube so this is just like a squeezing you know so i squeeze that uh, a loop of the bowel so that whatever is collecting there will go back towards the stomach and i have already kept ng tube there so through the ng tube i'll aspirate everything out this is one way okay this is one way but it takes a bit of time isn't it it takes a bit of time another one is insertion of a large bore tube proximal to the point of obstruction suction through that tube 
and then careful closure of the wound. Now, this is becoming less popular because of the risk of contamination. Definitely, it is easier to do. Okay, it is you know much quicker also. But one problem is there from the you know site of the insertion of the tube, something may leak outside into the peritoneal cavity. So there is a risk of contamination. And if we do not clean that properly, then later on peritonitis may happen. Another way is insertion of a fine needle obliquely through the tinea coli to drain the gas. So sometimes if the surgeon is very confident, you know, they can go for all these three methods. Now, what is the definitive management? Definitive management means you find out the cause. Where is the problem? Is it hernia? You have found out it. Now go for the treatment of hernia. Is it addition? Go for the, you know, divide that adhesive band. If it is tumor, go for the resection of the tumor. If it is stricture, go for the treatment. Okay, whatever uh, things are the causes, you find that out and go for the definitive treatment. This is known as definitive management. 